Being from a famous family is not always easy. But tonight's guest has come a very long way towards making his peace. He made his own distinct mark during Easy Rider. And uh, he's very uniquely Peter Fonda. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Peter. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, we all have demons inside, and some of them rage on for years. And uh, sometimes the passage of time seems to smooth these things out for no particular reason. That seems to be happening to you, or have happened, because I've known you a tiny bit over the yeah. years. Yeah, we have known each other for a long time. Well, finding Becky. Finding a mate. Finding a mate. And, and nothing against my first wife at all, you know. We had two beautiful children, yeah. and uh, I mean, I married her when I was 21, and she was 20, and my father said, you can't do that. At any rate, uh, the marriage didn't work out, but, but we did have beautiful children. Absolutely. And, uh, and I love them dearly, and they love me dearly. Every time we see, and uh, my stepson, I don't call him my stepson. I say, this Justin. is my son, Thomas. Oh, Tom, yeah. And Thomas and Justin are like that yeah. from the moment they met, and they are brothers. So. Way back when that. I was I going by and ringing him. the doorbell or ringing the Bermuda Bell, thinking, yeah. I've got the, the trump card in my back pocket. So somehow you felt, yeah, you felt that, that, that this was a cog that was going to mesh and it was going to fit. I must have known it, it from the get-go is what yeah. I'm saying. There was a quote that I remember you saying of saying, uh, I, I'm go if I'm known for the next 20 years as Bridget Fonda's father, I'll be happy. Yeah, and that's so, a great so thing many, to say about your child. So many years I was Beautiful. Henry Fonda's son, I was trying to figure that out because nobody knew who he was. Therefore, I had no idea who I was. I mean, was. nobody knew who he really was. We yeah, knew who I he didn't was know who he as was. a character. Yeah, of course. Not, Jane yeah. didn't know who he was, yeah. you know, and we were always trying to figure it out. Do you think he knew who he was before he died? I'll tell you this. He knew who I was. Yeah, good. Well, and that's I, important. I taught him to say, I, I directed him, actually. I created this thing I, uh, to say, I love you very much, son. And it, it was incredible. You think he did? And... Well, I, I, I probably did. I promise you this: that his last moments on Earth, alive, he was in intensive care in uh, Cedars of uh, Lebanon or Cedars Sinai. And uh, you know, he, his fifth wife was in the room, and Jane and her husband Tom and me. And you know, his big blue eyes are going like this, trying to find focus on his fifth wife. He looks at his daughter, his firstborn, then looks over at Tom. He looks at me, both of his eyes open up, and he looked at me, he said, I love you very much, son. Oh, Put his head down, closed his eyes, and died. You, you can't made ask him see straight. I don't you know if I made him see straight, but I didn't helped. want him. I knew that his <laughs> clock was running, and there were no, no timeouts. And before he left, I was insistent that this man would tell me he loved me. And it would not be just a line that he learned. Because he started by, re I, I did, I said, I'm going to teach you how to do this. And he went, I, I hung up the phone. Second time, I didn't tell him I was going to teach him. I just tell him whatever. I, I love you very much, Dad. <laughs> and hung up the phone. The fifth call, he spit it out as fast as he could. I love you too, son. I said, no, Dad. It doesn't work as something, as a response to something that I've said or done. It's something that originates in your heart. So you have to fill that moment from your heart. You have to find that moment and fill it. That's when it means it. And so, obviously, he found it and filled it. And he filled the void from all those years. I was in 42 in the last seconds. Boy, you were lucky. I am so lucky. Yeah. I mean, I get angry when I think about some of the things he didn't do, but I'm not mad at him. I don't want to kick him. I don't have any, any hangover from that, you know. Well, you have such a strong dose of family. That's well, the great thing about extraordinary be. people, extraordinary people and artists, and, you know, they pay. I mean, everybody wants to be this or that. They want to be a star. They want to be this or that. But nobody understands the price that almost always goes to make that steel. To make steel that can become extraordinary or human material, the fire that they go through, boy. The fire that one goes through. Holy moly. Yeah. We'll be right back with Peter Fonda. <laughs> I'm back with Peter Fonda. I directed my father finally found out I was not a loose cannon on the deck. But I had 78 people it. who... And that he had learned. Yeah. You'd learned. Yeah. Probably from him a lot, too. No, not. No, no. he was never You never went to, to his sets, but you didn't go to his sets and watch him? Or hang out in the sets? A couple of times, but... Uh, I know. It was always disturbing, because there he was, hell fellow well met on the set, and at home, the silent rage. 
we never understood that it wasn't it really was arranged. It was between him and your mother, right? It was between the things that in her life that she couldn't... Do you think that's what it was, or do you think it's was his it own youth? my dad? It was his own... It was his own youth, but his parents, what they did to him. Mary Eddie Baker weaves its way through there. Christian scientists weaves Boy, its way she, through there. Yeah. You know, and I only know four stories about my paternal grandparents. And over the 55 years I've been alive, there's only four stories that me and my sister and my cousins have ever heard the same four stories over and over again. And how was your father? Perfect. And your mother? Perfect. That's scary. That's very scary. When they start, it's even scarier than saying they're normal. Perfect. That's even scary. That's the scariest. God, poor baby. No, art, no, what no, art no. Comes I, from the horror art. No, no, no. I was thinking the poor baby of him. Oh, exactly. The poor baby of him. Exactly. Yeah. Well, he was but at least dying. he made his peace with you. That's a wonderful thing that that happened, that story, at his, at his deathbed. Well, you, you know, know, there were several moments before I was shooting a film in Texas, and I got the call. He's going, you've got to get here. I rented the jet. I flew into L.A. I walked in the intensive care unit of the hospital. Everybody's hushed in the room. When I come in, I said, what's going on in here? What are you doing in here? What? what? These are drugs. What are, you, what are you doing in... Have you told these people you have a heart problem, so they put you in... I told you, if you want drugs, call me. What is this? <laughs> and I'm working my way around the bed. You don't even know what these drugs are. What is, and, and look, everybody's upset by this. You're so thoughtless. You're so selfish. Grabbed his head and gave him a big kiss. Yeah. You know, my sister, yeah. she says, how do you do that? I said, well, you know, just don't wait for it to happen. You've got to make it happen. And it was because you were trying to bring him back to uh, out of numbness and into life. And, no, I wanted and, him to know that I was home. I was yeah, there. I was in the room. So you made a big disturbance. Yeah, because yeah. was, I, I was always trying to get his attention by making some sort of incredible disturbance, as was Jane. Yeah. yeah. Hollywood, you know, I was just thinking when you were telling me that story, I was thinking about art and the pain of artists children and what children because everything almost is given to the art you know all the love and and all the it was not all of it but uh, so much and also what drives someone to become an artist and then there's this whole new art hollywood mm -hmm. which you know influenced and went and fed and joyed and cheered and horrified the whole world okay. and 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 just what the children go through and there's sometimes good things sometimes hell what do you think the best thing that, that uh, Henry Fonda left inside you, that he gave you? What was the best thing, you think? I think the best thing was that one phrase, just before he died, having been able to not have to carry any of that luggage anymore in my life. And for him, too. I guess. I mean, I, I, I hope so. I tend I to want so. to believe it, so oh. I believe it. People often ask me what it was like growing up as Henry Fonda's son. And my standard comeback is, have you seen Fort Apache? Yes. And if you've seen Fort Apache, you know what he was like as yeah. Colonel Thursday. That was what he was like at home. And we all thought that he was mad. It wasn't. He was so shy, so painfully shy, he shut down everything, closed himself off, couldn't handle it. And imagine opening up that shyness to act. That's the only time he could do it. He had conversations. He could express himself when he had a character. So he's only alive. On, on the stage, screen. on screen, on his love, especially on stage. It was his love. And, of course, he was a non-actor, and that's the way to act. Don't let anybody see the, what you're doing. So it was almost like he had no personality in a funny way that he could show to other people unless he had put a character cloaked him over. He had hidden that personality from anybody's view. The way many of us do, even from his own view. Even his best friends. They may have had a little closer a look at it than I did, but... It was a hidden thing, and it was actually a gem. It's too bad he hid it. But the gem came out in a different way because he gave us great performances. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back with Peter Fonda. <laughs> I'm back with Peter Fonda. Okay, now, you live on 300 acres, you lucky thing. Yes. How do you feel about cities? <laughs> Can't sell a boat in the city. I know. And um, I really enjoy the idea of owning the ship, being the captain, owner, and master of the vessel. I like the idea of my sovereignty. See, admiralty law is very specific. It's the oldest internationally recognized rule in the world is uh, the maritime law, admiralty law. And You're your own country, basically, at sea, right? Pra practically speaking. And it's all based on one very simple principle. The captain's word is law. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I had a terrible experience when I was very young, when I was six. Not that young, I guess. Very young. And it stuck with me for a long time uh, in the form of a terrible nightmare of abuse. And uh, in my mind, uh, I was mechanically raped when I was six years old at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And what were you doing in there? I had no idea. Yeah. I thought we were going east to see my sister Pan. My mother told me this was the second time I'd been up in an airplane. At any rate, this problem, that ha this rape that happened to me in Johns Hopkins, they were looking in my body for a tapeworm. Ah. Going up my um, and you were six. rear. Mm -hmm. And nobody told me it was going to happen, so when it started happening, freaked me out and in other words I got raped and after that incident um, I had nightmares every night right. every single night there was no night without it from six on from six on I got I only was able to articulate it to myself when I was 15 I was so embarrassed I never told anybody about it and but I continued to have the nightmare it was a terrible nightmare because I'd be worried going to sleep that I was going to have the nightmare then I'd carry the nightmare the next day with me Recurring dream. It was the same one over and Absolutely. over? Absolutely. I found out on my boat, on my ship, I never had the nightmare. Even if the ship was in a slip in a but harbor. I couldn't get to you. I you don't you know. Were safe. I've really worked it out a long time. I've talked to a lot of shrinks about it and people, you know, therapists who are, are into it. And I said, the, my take is this, that I really bought into the program of the sovereignty of captain. All right. Good. And that on that ship, my word was law. Nobody could get to me. Yeah. And in fact, that's how I, I feel. I'd get off the ship, there was the nightmare. Yeah, and in uh, 1989, I got really close to too much edge. And I've always said, Ed, you know, on the edge is where you should be. But watch out. And uh, I went to my local GP uh, in Livingston, Montana. And I said, Dennis, look, I'm, I'm going bonkers here. And uh, I, I told him about my nightmare thing, and um, he put me on a medication. Mm -hmm. And it was take one pill a night for a week, and then two pills a night for a week, and then three pills a night for a week, and then four pills. And normally, if, the, if a pill doesn't work for me, I, I stop taking it. There's no point yeah. to it. It didn't work. But for some reason, I stayed with the program to the fifth and midway through the sixth week, taking four of these pills a night. I woke up one morning, and I'd had the best dreams, no nightmare. It was suddenly, beginning of the day was beautiful. And my life had gone through a terrific change when I was 35, except for the nightmare. And it was over. What happened Truly at fabulous. 35 when your whole life changed? Well, I had, uh, when I was 34, I was making a movie in Key West, Florida called 92 in the Shade. Ah. And uh, it was from a novel written by Tom McGuane, Thomas McGuane. But I insisted on playing on the role, and I called Tom up. I got him on the phone, and after four or five conversations, maybe ten, com ten calls, I finally said, listen, Tom, maybe you don't like my style of acting. Maybe you don't like the way my physical character is on screen. I don't know. And that's your prerogative. Well, then I met with him. And I cut my hair off, I had a beard. I shaved the beard, cut my hair off, and I met him in the Beverly Hills Hotel, not one of my favorite venues. <laughs> and, and I watched him for a while as we were talking, and I could see in his eyes that he wanted to direct the film. Yeah. Uh, and so I said, look, you want to direct, don't you? He kind of startled for a second. I can see that you want to direct the film. Do you want to direct the film? And he said, yes. He said, I, if I tell you yes, Tom, you'll get a million and a half on my yes. But if I tell you yes, you have to promise me something. That when you want to cut the scene, you count to ten, silently. If you still want to cut the scene, go ahead. He said, why? That's because you're a writer. And when the actors have finished reading your lines, you'll think the scene's over. And it doesn't work that way. Anyway, he directed the show, and uh, I met the voice. You met his wife? Yeah. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to come flying back with Peter. There you are. I'm back with Peter Fonda. So, uh, go back to what, what happened on this 35th. Okay, well. You met his wife. The four great foot Becky. 11. <laughs> perfect. Perfect person. Perfect for me. Four foot 11. And I, and I like tall girls. It had nothing to do with that. It was herself, and I thought, boy, and I, did, I didn't admit to it when I first met her. I thought, wow, well, you know, I, nice I met life. her son. He was so cool. I thought he's very bright. He's seven years old, and he wants an older brother, and he thought that I was the bill, but I knew that I had in my back pocket my son. This is long, but it's great. 
who was 51 weeks older than Thomas. Exactly. So I had the game locked up with the son. Unfair, unfair. No, bullets. totally fair. <laughs> totally yeah, fair. Yeah, they say it's all fair. Because I didn't think anything about it. And uh, I had gotten to like him very much. And if I finished shooting early, I'd drive by their house and ring my Bermuda Bell or throw a firecracker out the window. He'd come running, jump in, and we'd go sail kites or we'd go have a hamburger someplace because my mind said, I'm going to show her how a father treats his son. Because yeah. I know Big yeah, Tom was not doing that. Now, where did that come from, Lauren? I mean, because you can still be a kid. Because your, your experience in life has been so extreme. You know, I'm sure your older sister, who was only a few years older, right? Two years, two months. Two years. Boy, that's close. She was fighting for her life. Absolutely. And suddenly there was this new little thing trying to take she what was, tiny little bit of attention she could get. She hated me for it. Of course, yeah. who wouldn't? Uh, I so mean, we love each struggling. other now. Yes, also, that's because you all grew up. You got to grow up. So few of us get to grow up, or only parts of us get to grow up. But you can still be a kid. So you're you nice to say you. that to me because I don't think I've grown up. I think it's true, but you know what I mean about growing. At least you grow through the fire and you forgive. And well, that's anyway, what okay. Up is. So you can be cut, a kid. Cutting the chase, we're, we're going to the 35th birthday here. Briefly summarizing, as I started this film called Race with the Devil with Warren Oates, and we're shooting in San Antonio, Texas, uh, where Davy Crockett died, and. Uh, um, Becky Crockett, Portia Rebecca Crockett, is Davy Crockett's great, 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 great granddaughter. You know, that right. Was just there. Warren told me that Becky and Tom were getting divorced. I got on the phone right away and said, now's not a good time to be alone in January in Key West. I'm going to fly you on up here to San Antonio. Your friend Jim Harrison's coming down and all that. Well, I, I got her there. We got together, and we've not been apart since then. Right. And um, that was, that was January 19th. That was very fast move, wasn't it? That was, you were on the phone how quick after uh, Warren slipped you the, Within slipped seconds. You the skinny? I, I went to a cop's car and I said, I have a radio, <laughs> highway radius license. Can you, can you get me the, uh, the highway uh, operator? Oh. And, I and you had been car. percolating that scene for like... Uh, without knowing it. Yeah, without... Uh, yeah, Seriously, it the was, way the most I, it's, a, it's a full innocent. And my first night with her, it was, it was actually it was morning because we had been night shooting. It was so innocent. It was, I, was, I was embarrassed. It was very far out. And, you know, to be. When, when I got her up there, it was great. It was the cops that were on the set, I said, look, uh, Davy Crockett's great, 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 great granddaughter is going to come up here to visit me. I want the best hotel room in town. Tell me about the best hotel room. That's the governor's suite, this thing on the river walk. Get it. Let me get on the phone. I, I ordered I said, now I need every yellow rose you can find. Yeah. So true. all the cops' wives so thought, this yeah. is terrific. This yeah. guy's a real romantic. <laughs> and I fill the room with yellow roses on every flat surface except for the bed and the vanities everywhere on the in drawers you'd open up yellow roses everywhere yellow rose means loyalty ah. and the yellow rose of texas was in there and davy crockett it was yeah. all yeah. mixed up yeah. oh, anyway so everything that was january 19th some february 23rd comes around we're still in san antonio she's been back and forth now as many times as she can she came back for my 35th birthday and in the room, I had a suite in Holiday Inn. This means they open the connecting doors and take the beds out and put a couch in. And uh, Warren and I and the second assistant, Steve Lim, um, Bob Watkins, Warren's driver, and Bob's girlfriend, we're all uh, celebrating my birthday. Right. And Becky. Portia, I was, I was calling her then still. And Becky gave me a present. I opened it up, and it was her childhood copy of E.B. White's Stuart Little. I had read this book when I was six and seven and eight. Ah. And Stuart Little, a mouse, born into a regular family. His father, Mr. Little, was a dentist, and his mother, Mrs. Little, they were regular humans. But they, they never made a problem for Stuart. They made him a little bed. They made him a little car, everything. Stuart actually contributed to the family. Mrs. Little lost her engagement ring down the sink. They lowered, lowered, yeah, they lowered Stuart down with a string, and he picked it up and all this stuff. He was my hero. Because you felt like a mouse inside a family? You bet. Yeah. And if Stuart Youngest could do kid. it, I could do it. Right. If Stuart could survive, I could survive. And I never told anybody. No, none of my sisters, no mother, right. father, nobody. Yeah. Nobody knew. It was my innermost secret that my hero was E.B. White's mouse. Yeah. Now, I have to think, this, this woman, she was 34. She gives me, on my 35th birthday, her copy of Stuart Little, she didn't know. Who gives a 35-year-old man a children's book? Sometimes those are those magic I believe moments, I'm with huh? the person I was born to yeah. be with.
It's a great story. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great love story. It's it great. truly is. Yeah. I had a great time, Peter. Me too. I really had a great time. Please come back again. You bet. I'll bring a lot of carrots with me. And uh, I want to come visit you guys, you, you and should. Becky and the kids up in Montana. Mm -hmm. You can come visit me in my joint. Nice I, got, I got 300 acres, too. Cool. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. You bet. <laughs>